John heard in prison about the deeds of the Christ, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? And Jesus answered them, Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight and the lame walk. Lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up, and the poor have good news preached to them. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. So during that last song, um, I just kept on getting a, a picture, uh, kind of a video in my mind. I, I just kept on picturing somebody flailing in the water, screaming, flailing, come to realize they were in two feet deep water. Um, and I think some of us, we, we start flailing, we start freaking out, and we forget, no matter how dark it gets, that the God of the universe, he is always with you. He will never let you drown. Um, and some of you, you just need to stand and realize that there's, there's a floor under you, um, and it's the presence of the Lord. It's the presence of the Lord. Um, happy Mother's Day, moms. You can clap. Let's clap for the moms, all right? Um, moms, we love you, uh, and I mean that we appreciate you, and we'll talk about later. We need you. Uh, we need you, and we have uh, candles for you moms out there. Take a bag. Um, all of them are covered, so you can't pick a scent. So whatever scent you get, just believe that's the scent that the Lord wanted you to smell in your, in your home. Uh, there's a photo booth outside that our events team just put together. It's beautiful. Take a picture with your family today. But we appreciate you moms, and we're glad that you are here um, we are continuing our series through the gospel according to Matthew, and we are getting closer to the end. We've been in this book for over a year now, going through this gospel verse by verse. Let me just say thank you for hanging in there. You're thinking, Frank, we have no choice. True, but thank you for hanging in there. And today we find ourselves, I believe, providentially in Matthew chapter 20. Uh, here, Jesus tells another parable. Um, and this parable really is a continuation from Matthew chapter 19. Um, some of you know this, but one third of all of Jesus' teachings are in parable form or in story form because 2,000 years ago, people had a longer attention span than today, right? Now we need video, we need 15 second snippets to keep our attention, but back then, Jesus and other rabbis, they would just sit down and tell these stories, and the Greek word for parable is parabole, say parabole, parabole, and it literally means to place something alongside something else. So a parable is an earthly story to teach us a heavenly lesson, a practical story to teach us a deep, profound truth. And like I said, chapter 20 really is a continuation from chapter 19. Uh, you guys know this, chapters and verses, these were added many, many, many years later for our convenience. And sometimes, like today, I think sometimes those divisions are, are not, the, they don't make the best sense in the bigger context. So let, let's quickly revisit chapter 19, the end of chapter 19. We have the rich young ruler. He arrogantly comes to Jesus and says, hey, Jesus, what good deeds can I do to get eternal life? And Jesus says, hey, keep all the commands. He says, I've done all that. Okay, sell all of your possessions. Give it to the poor. He walks away discouraged because this young ruler's God was money, and he was unwilling to give that up to follow Jesus. Some of you are the same way. That's the one thing, the last thing to get saved in a Christian's life many times is their wallet, okay? Um, and then Jesus says, it's easier for a camel to go through an eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God and disciples and ask, then who can be saved? Jesus says, with man this is impossible, with God all things are possible, amen? And then Peter chimes, it's always interesting when Peter chimes in. He says, well, Jesus, we, we've left everything we've known. What do we get? And Jesus says at the end of chapter 19, first will be last, last will be first. That is the principle. Chapter 20, Jesus tells a parable to really further emphasize this 
principle. So Matthew 20, verses 1 and 2, it's on the screen. For the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. So back then, you got to realize your day began at 6 a.m. and it ended at 6 p.m. It was a 12-hour day. So you would find laborers in the marketplace just waiting to be hired because they needed to do some work to make some money. So this landowner goes out early in the morning, finds some workers in the marketplace to work his field. They negotiate a wage of one denarius for the day. They agree, shake hands, 6 a.m. to 6 p.m., one denarius, agreed, handshake, done. Okay. Goes on, verse 3 through 7. And going out about the third hour, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And to them he said, you go into the vineyard too, and whatever is right I will give you. So they went. Going out again about the sixth hour and the ninth hour, he did the same. And about the eleventh hour, he went out and found others standing. And he said to them, why do you stand here idle all day? They said to him, because no one has hired us. He said to them, you go into the vineyard Two. So the landowner goes back into the marketplace at the third hour, which is 9 a.m. Notice this, friends. They don't negotiate a wage here. They don't agree on the price. He just says, whatever is right, I will give you. And they trusted him, and they just needed some work. So they went to work for him. He goes out again the sixth and ninth hour, which is noon and 3 p.m. Same thing. No negotiation. I will pay you what I think is right. Goes out again the 11th hour. This is 5 p.m. So these people will probably work less than an hour. Same thing. No negotiation. I will pay you what I think is right. Right, so the 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. crew agreed on the wage, one denarius for the whole day, shook on it, 12 p.m. to 6 p.m. crew, they'll get paid whatever the landowner deems right, same goes for the 3 to 6 p.m. crew, same goes for the 5 to 6 p.m. crew. You guys tracking? Right? Verse 8, and when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, hey, call the laborers and pay them their wages beginning with the last up to the first. Okay. So the day is over. It's, ta- it's time to pay the men who've worked. And interestingly, this guy starts with the last. So he starts with the one-hour worker all the way to the 12-hour crew. Why? I think it's because he wanted to test those who worked all day. Okay. Again, this is a parable. Verse 9 through 16, he continues. And when those hired about the 11th hour came, each of them received a denarius. Now, when those hired first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received a denarius. And on receiving it, they grumbled at the master of the house, saying, These last worked only an hour, if that, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. They're getting very dramatic here. But he replied to one of them, friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for one denarius? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last worker as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose to do with what belongs to me? It's my money. Or do you begrudge my generosity? So the last will be first and the first last. So the guys who worked only for one hour, I mean, I think it's less. You you consider the travel time from the marketplace to the vineyard. They also received one denarius, and it started with them as far as the pay order went. So you imagine the guy standing in line who worked 12 hours, and they're watching the one-hour guy get paid one denarius. They're probably thinking, licking their lips, eyes, we're going to get paid. Because if they worked for an hour and they're getting paid a denarius, we're going to get paid, I don't know, at least double or triple. And it gets to the 12-hour guys, the 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. guys, and they're probably licking their lips in excitement of their payday, and they receive one denarius as well. 
So the guys who work the 12 hours, they start complaining and grumbling, saying, they only worked one hour. We worked 12 hours in the scorching heat. It's not fair. Hear me, friends. Grace is not fair. Grace is not fair. And the landowner responds, whoa, 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 I'm not jipping you of anything. Like, we shook hands. You agreed to one denarius, correct? Yes. So I have given you everything that I promised you. I am not holding back anything. This is what I want to do. This is my money. This is my land. I own the property. I am being good to my word. You have nothing to grumble about. We shook hands. We agreed. And that was a deal. I mean, a union boss would hate this story. (laughs) Hear me. Also, this is not a case for socialism, all right? Just to be clear. What what was the nature of the grumbling and the complaints of the 12-hour crew? Was it because they weren't given what they were promised? No. Their complaint really was against the big-heartedness and the generosity of the landowner. So suddenly, they're not getting what they deserve in the scorching heat. When they agree to the denarius, suddenly we're not getting what we deserve. Verse 15, 16, let's read that again. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me, or do you begrudge? My generosity. Do you begrudge my big heartedness? Last will be first, first will be last. Friends, hear me. God is good. Amen? God is gracious. God is very, very generous. So when you read in the Bible, when you read any parable, it is critical for us to identify the characters in the story as it relates to us and God. So in this parable, the landowner is God. The workers, these are believers, followers, and the shifts is where each believer is in their walk with the Lord. Okay. Have you ever felt in your life, ever thought, maybe never verbalized, but you thought, God is unfair? Okay. If you haven't, you're, you're probably lying. We've all had those moments where we're like, God is unfair. Like, God, I've saved myself for marriage and I know they haven't, but they're engaged, and I'm still single. God, I tithe, I serve, I've been doing this for years, and yet that person who became a Christian yesterday just got promoted. God, I share Christian blogs and posts on Facebook all the time, and I only get two likes. That guy shared it one time, and it goes viral. It's not fair. (laughs) Um, It feels like you're not getting what you deserve. Okay. It feels like these twelve-hour this twelve-hour crew. It felt like they weren't getting what they deserved simply because. They got the same grace that they got. Okay? Hear me. If you deal with God, hear me, in the same way the 12 hour crew dealt with the landowner who worked all day long, give me what I deserve, hear me. I don't think we want what we deserve. If you really sit down and think about it, Um, if you've read the Bible, I don't think we want what we deserve. Um, I never asked the Lord, God, give me what I deserve. No, Lord, give me what you think is right. Lord, you know what I need. God, I'm pleading with you. Um, I'm urging you. But you know what I need. I believe you will provide for all of my needs. Hear me, not your greeds. We get that mixed up. 
James says, God says no, and he doesn't answer your prayers because it's all about you and it's all selfish. And you take those verses, ask whatever you wish in my name, it will be given you, and you totally take that out of context and you make it about you and your Ferrari or whatever. Okay? You and I, hear me, we do not want what we deserve. What we deserve is eternal separation from God. What we deserve is eternal damnation in a place called hell. That's, what we, that's justice. Everything else is grace. With that said, does this parable today remind you of another one of Jesus' probably one of the most well-known parables? Uh, parable of the prodigal son. Right? The 12-hour workers remind you of the older son we're grumbling, we worked 12, they worked one, it's not fair, we were in the heat, in the scorching sun for 12, they were in the scorching heat for maybe 30 to 45 minutes, it's not fair. Similarly, the older son was like, Father, I've been here, I've worked, I've been faithful, I've been obedient, I've been good, I've worked hard, he squandered all of your things, he doesn't deserve a party, he should be punished. Um, what's the key word for the 12 p.m. crew and the older son? It's I. I did this. I've been good. I've been faithful. I've been obedient. I've done this. I've stayed away from this unlike them. I, I, I. Hear me. Salvation is not based on I. Salvation is based on he. He is faithful he is good, he is patient, he is gracious, amen. Okay. So this is the crazy, scandalous thing about salvation and the gospel illustrated in this parable. That it doesn't matter if you work for 12 hours or one hour, everybody receives the same salvation, the same glorious heaven, the same glorious communion with God, amen. To be clear, Please do not hear what I'm not saying. I'm not saying we, we need a work for our salvation like this parable. That's not what this is saying. Salvation is by grace through faith alone. But for the purposes of this parable, it doesn't matter. Friends, hear me. Whether you've been a Christian for your entire life, which is awesome, which is what we pray for our kids, that you would save them at an early age, or you are saved on your deathbed, same salvation. Same salvation. Maybe less heartache or more heartache, but same salvation. Right? Religious people have a problem with this. Religious people don't like grace. Religious people is grace for me, judgment for them. It's mercy for me, judgment for them. I mean, I remember years ago, James Dobson coming out of the prison cell after meeting with Ted Bundy. Do you, anybody remember this? James Dobson said, I'm paraphrasing, but pretty much Ted Bundy is a born-again believer. So, I've been faithful. I'm not perfect. I've been obedient. I've been good. I've followed you, Jesus, for 50 years, so you're telling me that I may see Ted Bundy, the guy who murdered 50 women for kicks, you're telling me that I may see Ted Bundy in heaven with all the other saints? I'm saying if he was saved, yes. That is a scandalous nature of the gospel that just works against every religious fiber in your being that says it's not fair. Grace is not fair. And hear me, we don't want fair. Right? We don't want fair. There's a quote that went viral. I don't know who wrote it, but it says that the Apostle Paul entered heaven to the cheers of those he martyred because that's how the gospel works. The Apostle Paul is going to enter heaven to the cheers of those he murdered. That's how the gospel works. That's how unthinkable, how anti-human, anti-cultural, anti-flesh the gospel is. 
how unthinkable the gospel works, that those that you think are irredeemable, Jesus is like, he's redeemable. You're dirty. You're damaged goods. That's my daughter. And her wedding dress will be white on her wedding day. Why? Because she's pure and spotless without blemish in my sight. Um, that's how the gospel works. Amen. And if you're religious, this is just rubbing you like sandpaper. Because you've been good. And you've been faithful. And you've kept all the rules. And you haven't done that. And you haven't done this. Um, unfortunately, the only standard to enter into heaven is perfection. Last time I checked, nobody is perfect except Jesus. So we rest on his perfection, not on ours. It is a futile effort. Okay. This is how unthinkable the gospel is. So for those of you that think, think of that group, think of that person, like, man, they are beyond God's grace. And God's like, no, they're not. No, they're not. Um, so with that said, let me give you a few um, practical takeaways from this parable. I'm calling it the four don'ts. Number one, uh, don't assume that God owes you anything. Let me be very clear. God does not owe you and I anything. Actually, no, he does owe you and I judgment. Okay. Hear me, but instead of us getting what we deserve, Jesus got what we deserve so that we could receive what we do not deserve. That's the gospel. First Corinthians, that he who knew no sin became sin on our behalf so that we may, have, we may become the righteousness of God. The, the great exchange. Let me say that again. Instead of us getting what we deserve, Jesus got what we deserve so that we can receive what we do not deserve. Okay. In addition, friends, um, and we do this sometimes, don't hold God to promises he never made. He never promised that you'd be loaded. He never promised that you will always be healthy on this side. He never promised that if you're just a good moral person, that you'll be okay. Right? The prosperity gospel is not the gospel. The affirming progressive gospel is not the gospel. There's only one gospel. We'll talk about this during our reclaim series. We need to reclaim the gospel. Um, hear me, God not meeting your expectations is not, the same, is, not, is not the same as God not keeping his promise. God didn't answer my prayer. Yes, he did. It just didn't meet your expectations. Right? Don't assume that God owes you and I anything. Okay. Gospel, cross, Death, resurrection, psh, everything after that, sprinkles. Okay. Number two, don't. Don't grumble or complain about how God chooses to bless other people. Hear me. When we take our eyes off of all the ways that God has blessed us, and fix them on how God is blessing others, that is a recipe for resentment and bitterness. Let me say that again. When we take our eyes off of all the ways that God has blessed you, and you just fix it on all the ways God is blessing others, that is a recipe for you to become resentful and bitter and saying stuff like, it's not fair, they, they don't deserve it, stuff like that. Okay. Um, God's blessing, hear me, it's not contingent upon, 
upon how hard you and I work. It is based on his goodness. It is based on his goodness. Okay? And here's what I'm learning. When you get to the place where you realize you have gotten from God what you do not deserve, then you can start celebrating in others when they get from God things they don't deserve. Until that happens, there's always a sense of the 12-hour workers complaining about the 5 p.m. workers. When we finally realize that we're getting things that I don't deserve, thank you, then we can start celebrating when others in our life, in our purview, are getting things that they don't deserve as well. Right? And some of you, you live your life pretty much carrying a fairness calculator. You're just calculating what's fair and what's not, and you try to balance everything out, and honestly, that has become an idol for you. That your life is based on a system of equality rather than God's system of generosity. Put the calculator down. You'll drive yourself crazy. Right? And you forget that you and I, that you are also a recipient of God's unfairness. Because hear me, we don't want fair. You don't want fair. I do not want fair. I plead for unfair. Unfair. Grace is unfair. Salvation is unfair. God's goodness is unfair. God's blessing is unfair. I want unfair. I don't want fair. Amen? Okay. Um, number three. Don't look down on the 5 p.m. workers. Because you may find yourself in that 5 p.m. worker position yourself. Meaning, these 5 p.m. workers, really, they didn't have much to offer. They could maybe offer 45, 30 minutes of labor until it hits 6 p.m but they were grateful for what they received. And the 12-hour workers were looking down on the one-hour, 5 p.m. workers. Do not look down on those where they're still a little rough around the edges. They don't know the, the church lingo. They, they don't know their theology they don't know their Bible that well much. I remember giving a young man a Bible years ago to read. He came back, he's like, Frank, um, you told me to read the Bible and it's not working because it just makes me feel like super bad about myself. I was like, bro, it's working. <laughs> it's working real good. Um, keep going and you'll find Jesus. Um, But this is where we get into trouble, right? Don't look down on those people. And we, we have some crazy stories in this room um, where God just lifted you out of the muck and the mire, and God is using you. And you may be, again, rough around the edges. You don't have a theological construct. You don't have your views on spiritual gifts, on uh, predestination, on end times. It doesn't matter. But you love the Lord and you realize he saved you and you're, and you're going in that direction. Don't look down on them. Help them. Pray for them. Encourage them because they are getting the same salvation that you 65-year-old Christians are getting as well. Same grace, same heaven, same glorious communion with the Lord. Amen. Lastly, number four, don't always look at what you can get but on what you can give. Hear me, the landowner, when he went out in the 11th hour, 5 p.m., found the workers probably going to give them 30 minutes of labor. He knew these guys had nothing really to offer. He just wanted to bless them. Okay. He wanted to bless them. And we live in a culture where it's all consumption 
It's all consumer, and it's seeped into the church on what can you give me? What programs do you have for my children? What do you have for my needs? Do you have this for me? It's all, even in church, it's about me because I'm the customer, and the customer is always right, not the church, though. Not the church. Jesus is always right, and the customer is usually wrong. Right? That we're not always looking for what we can get. Look at what you can give. Sometimes, hear me, I'm not broad stroking, but I've met people. The most depressed people can be the most selfish people you can ever meet. Because it's all about me, 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 navel gaze. Everybody stop what you're doing and look at me. Tend to my needs, look at my struggle, and you tend to forget. If you look out, it can help. It can help. Okay. Let me say this. Um, Whether you've been a follower of Jesus for 12 hours or for one hour, same heaven, knowing that you've received something that you did not deserve, knowing that Jesus did all of the work and you receive all of the benefits, do you know what that does in you? That makes you want to live for him and work for him and go forward for his kingdom, amen. But in that order, I know I beat this drum because religion is strong in Pittsburgh. We work and we run and we work hard and there's effort and there's drive. Not so that we would be recipients of his grace, but because we have been recipients of his grace. Amen. That's why we work. That's why we move forward. That's why we charge hell with a water gun. Because of that grace that we receive that we don't deserve, we work and we move forward. Ephesians 2 said, hear me, that we've been saved by grace through faith so that nobody can boast. That means the 12 hour or the one hour or the one year Christian versus the 45 year old Christian, both of them can only say it is by grace through faith that I'm here. You can't boast, you can't boast. By grace, through faith, alone, but he says also that we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for what? For good works. So hear me, let me be clear. We are not saved by works, but we are saved for works. If you are saved and you're sitting idly by doing nothing, something's off kilter. That eternal life, hear me, is not something that happens only when you die. Eternal life happens the moment you accept Jesus as your king, as your savior. You start moving. Desires change. Thinking changes. What you love to do, now you hate to do. What you hated to do, now you want to do. And your friends are like, hey, let's go party. You're like, no, I just want to stay home and read the Bible. What did I just say? Like, what? Like, just things change. That's what, that's what not religion, that's what the Holy Spirit does in you, right? Um, look at what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 25. Paul says, do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things, They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we are, we and imperishable, so I do not run aimlessly. I'm not shadow boxing, beating the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. So during the Greek Olympics, when it first started, what they, it wasn't gold medals, it was just a, a circular twig with leaves on it that would die probably the next day. So they're running for a perishable wreath. He's saying, we're running for something that's imperishable. Hear me, let me be clear. This is not talking about salvation. Paul is talking about eternal rewards once we get into heaven. Because Paul is a Christian here. Right? Um, salvation is by grace and grace alone. But 1 Corinthians makes it clear, when we get to heaven, we'll be rewarded based on our good deeds that we've done on earth. 
So run. Don't waste your life. Don't waste your youth. Don't waste those gray hairs. Don't die on a golf course. Invest those years. Invest that energy, right? Um, I think in heaven, I believe there are going to be some um, gracious, glorious surprises, meaning I think there's going to be people who've never preached a sermon, who've never had any sort of significant ministry, they never led a small group, but they have served faithfully behind the scenes. Okay. Right. If you read earlier in Matthew, if you remember, it's, it, he says that when you do a righteous deed, don't let your right hand know what your left hand is doing, but do it in secret so the Father who sees you in secret will reward you. So here is the um, downfall, I think, I'm talking about me, of doing public ministry. Because everybody sees you, and sometimes they criticize, but sometimes they, they, they encourage you and compliment you, and sometimes that can get to your head. So I won't be surprised in heaven where, where the pastors are all in the back of the line with the fewest rewards, <laughs> and the ones who are just loaded with the rewards are the ones that never preached a sermon, never had a public ministry, um, but just were so faithful behind the scenes. Amen. And hear me, when I think of those who are faithful behind the scenes, the people that the masses may not see, but the Father sees, uh, I, I think of moms. Okay. This is why I believe this is providential. Okay. Uh, moms, we love you. Um, and let me submit, we need you. Okay. Um, and to my bride, babe, where are you? There she is. Um, to my bride and to the mother of our five children, uh, shoot, I love you, babe, um, and I appreciate you so much. Um, and you guys know I say often about having steel in my spine, but what I don't say often enough is Mari is the one behind me pouring that steel in my spine. Okay. Okay. Um, so when Proverbs 31 says that her children arise and will call her blessed and her husband also, and he praises her, uh, babe, our five kids are blessed, and I am blessed, and our five children would be so different if I was with them all the time in the worst way possible. <laughs> um, moms, we love you, okay? Let, let me end with two powerful quotes that I found on motherhood and on moms. I, I want you moms to hear this. The first one was a, by a guy named Charles Spurgeon. Uh, I love him so much that I named our second boy Jack Spurgeon Park. He says that you are as much moms serving God and looking after your own children and training them up in God's fear and minding the house and making your household a church for God as you would be if you had been called to lead an army to battle for the Lord of hosts. Amen! Amen! Um, C.S. Lewis says this, children are not a distraction from more important work. They are the most important work. They are the most important work. Friends, we at Tov. We don't have children simply because they're adorable. We have children because what? Legacy matters. That's why. That's why. We're going to outpopulate the crazies. That's what we're doing. <laughs> right? But legacy matters. That when you are training your children in your home, and you're praying with them, you are going at war with darkness. It matters. And we live in a day where motherhood is something that you end up with rather than something you actually strive for. Like, that's the goal. That's the goal. Um, 
That somehow your children and being a mom is preventing you from reaching your dream and your aspirations. It is the most, am I saying you shouldn't work? That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying children are the most important work. Okay. Um, Pastor Johnny, are you here? Are you here? Raise your hand if you're here. He's back there. Liz, are you here? Pastor Johnny's wife? She's back there. Kat, are you here? Raise your hand. Okay. Um, I, I, got, I got Johnny's permission and Liz's permission. Okay. Um, if you know Pastor Johnny, our student pastor, and you know Liz, his beautiful wife, Liz Mayak, um, I've learned if you've been at Pittsburgh for a little bit, you realize everybody is related to Liz Mayak somehow. <laughs> like that, that Liz, that, that family, it, 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 it reaches deep. Um, and so I've met Liz and Kat. Liz and Kat are sisters. I've met their mom. Her name's Karen. Um, she's a tiny little woman. Okay. Um, she had... She has seven children, all walking with the Lord, and those seven children have 27, one on the way, so 28 grandchildren, Um, and the seven children, they're doing well spiritually, professionally. Um, Do we have a picture? Um. That, that little lady right in the middle with the red pants, that's, that's Karen. Um, leave that picture up there. Okay. 28 grandchildren, seven children, one tiny woman who decided that motherhood is my ministry who decided that motherhood and children, they are not distractions from my work. They are my most important work. And you look at that picture, that, my friends, is what I call a legacy and generational blessing. And you think about all the children those 28 grandchildren will have, that's exponential. Okay. She would say, of course, the grace of God but she did all of that, okay? Um, so moms, hear me. What you are doing, it absolutely matters. What you are praying into your children, though you may not see the fruition of that till many years later, it absolutely matters, the, the, the Bible stories you're reading your kids and they're just like nodding off and looking around and it seems like it's not coming in. It absolutely matters. Right? You pointing them to Jesus, it absolutely matters. Okay? This is the long game. And moms, if we would see our children as our most important work, I think things could change. Okay. Um, Some of you, if you're honest, this is me. You are here, and you are still alive, and you are still praising Jesus after all that you've been through because of the pleading prayers of your mom, because of the sleepless nights of your mom on her knees over her bedside, pleading in tears for the salvation of my son, of my daughter. That's why you're here. That's why you're here. Paul says in 2 Timothy that, Timothy, you are here because of the faith of your grandma, Lois, and your mom, Eunice. You're not here without those ladies of the faith, of those matriarchs of the faith. So moms, we want to honor you today. 
Not just with candles, not just with, those are fun, but I, I want to honor you, to, to instill in you just the, the weight and the significance of what you are doing in your home with your children, even if it seems like nothing is happening, the Holy Spirit is doing something through you, and though the world may not see it, and the world may not praise it, and the world may not give you accolades, the Father sees it, the Father sees you, the Father is proud of you. He's proud of you, okay? And your labor is not in vain, okay? Um, and I'm also aware that Mother's Day, for some of you, is not a celebration, it's a grieving day, okay? Um, whether you struggle with infertility, um, and kind of like this parable. You're like, I, God, I've been faithful. Um, I've been faithful. I've been faithful. Um, we have a good marriage. Um, they don't, and they have four kids. I just want one. And every Mother's Day, maybe for you, just a reminder of God's not being good, and that's a lie. I'm praying that today there would be a supernatural comfort um, that even in the valley that you would never doubt God's goodness in your life. Um, some of you, Mother's Day is hard because your children are wayward or there's just so much tension in your relationship. So this is not a fun day for you. I'm praying for comfort and I'm praying also for supernatural restoration, forgiveness, reconciliation of that relationship. Amen. Right. Um, so, Ben, you can come up now. Um, so, moms, we love you. Um, and we do this only by the grace of God. Amen. Um, you can't raise your kids faithfully without Jesus' presence. You can't endure the ups and downs of motherhood without Jesus' presence. Right. Um, let me say this, um, and I shared this weeks ago, and I want to share it with you moms. The greatest advice for you and for me, I guess in parents in general, is you need the Holy Spirit. Um, because you moms, you know this, you cannot always be there for your children, but you know who can? The Holy Spirit can. And there are times where you don't know what to do with your children, and it is beyond you, it's not beyond the Holy Spirit. So moms, I am praying for a fresh empowerment of the Holy Spirit in your life. Um, and if there are days where you feel unseen, um, and let me, this is not in my notes. Husbands, let, let me just give a word of challenge for you and for me. Um, tell your wives how much you appreciate them. She knows. No, she doesn't because you've never verbalized it. Let them know that you appreciate them. Honor them. Encourage them. Because they are doing the Lord's work. And l let, me, let me say a word to, to you single moms. Because I'm a product of a single mom. And being a single mom, I've seen it. It is. It's difficult. Um. Because I remember multiple evenings walking in, in on my mom, just sobbing. Because um, me and my brother were being complete morons. Just, just at her wit's end, um, with no support of a husband, of a father. So if you're a single mom, um, man, the, the Lord sees you. Um, 
and the Lord honors you and the Lord is proud of you. And all of your labor, again, is not in vain. And the Lord who sees you, he will reward you. Okay. Um, but it's all because of grace. All of this is because of grace. Okay. So here's what I do. I know I'm kind of ending the, the service on a, on a somber note. I'm, try, I'm trying to pick it back up, right? Um, but it is the grace of God. Right. So hear me. Moms, whether you've been a Christian for 12 months or for 12 years, that grace is there for you to help you, to encourage you, to strengthen you, to know that you are never alone, that God will always empower you to something he has called you to do. Amen. It is good grace. He's a good God. He's a generous God. And that, my friends, is worth singing about. Amen. So can we stand? We're going to stand. I'm going to pray. And then we're going to sing about just the grace of God that empowers and infiltrates even the most dire of circumstances, that his grace is there, his grace is with you, his grace will never leave you, his grace will empower you to be the mom that God has called you to be, amen. Your most important work, that motherhood is your ministry, not a distraction for something else. Let me pray. Father, thank you, thank you, thank you, that your grace does not show favoritism. That there are no JV varsity Christians. Thank you. That whether we've been with you for 50 years or 50 minutes, the grace that we receive is the same. Salvation is the same. Glorious communion with you is the same. That our status with you is the same. And we celebrate that. So God, I pray that we as a people, that we will start seeing of all that we have received from you that we did not deserve. So that maybe we can start celebrating the grace that you show on others that they also don't deserve. God, I want to pray a prayer of blessing to all the moms in this room grandmas, great-grandmas, mothers, spiritual mothers. Holy Spirit, would you just speak to their soul? Um, and would you let them know that you see them and that you are proud of them? I know we have some moms where the kids are out of the house and there, there's a little bit of trepidation. Now, now they're out and now they're kind of on their own and, and I don't know, are they going to stay with the Lord? Are they going to be swept away by the culture? I pray you just give them uh, some, some resolve that they have the Holy Spirit and though they can't be with them all the time, you are with them all the time. And that all the years that you've used the mom to instill in these children the gospel, your values, that, that none of that wasn't vain. God, I pray for the moms that they are just, they are in the thick of it. The babies, toddlers, it's just, it's tiring, it's, it's, it's frustrating, it's joyful, but then it's frustrating, makes us feel bipolar, just, it's, it's all over the place. I pray for them also that you would give them and talk to them and speak to them and tell them that they are doing a good job. That you see them. What they're doing behind the scenes, you see all of that and you are proud of them. Can I pray for the moms who Man, the only thing they want, they, they so deeply desire to be a mom. Um, and it has not happened yet. Holy Spirit, we pray.
pray that you would speak a word of deep, deep comfort to them on Mother's Day. That you are close to the brokenhearted and to the crushed in spirit. guys, I just feel compelled right now, very specifically, um, the family, I know they come here, and God, we've been praying for this baby named Oliver, and we, we know, and we learned that Oliver, at the age of two months, passed away last week, and God, I'm sure that Mother's Day is going to be very, very complicated for them. God, I pray for this family that you would supernaturally um, give them your comfort today. Um, But God, we are so gracious in the midst of all the ups and downs, what remains constant, what remains steadfast is your grace and your presence. So God, no matter what we're going through, we can still worship. Worship in the joy, worship in the pain, worship in the confusion, worship in the frustration, worship in the the excitement. We are called to worship until we feel it, not when we feel it. So thank you for the grace, the sustaining grace, the enduring grace. We love you. We thank you, Jesus, we pray this in your glorious name. All of God's people said, amen. Let's sing, church.